Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be back uh, with you. Uh, last week, uh, Laura and I got back from a week-long vacation. We went out west, and uh, there was a, uh, a beautiful time of vacation for us. There was a couple of unique features about our, our trip. Uh, one of them was that we were on islands the whole time. So we flew into Vancouver Island, never been to Vancouver Island, and then we stayed in, in San Juan Islands, which is in Washington State, and a beautiful area. So we got a chance to see the beauty of the forested land of Orcas Island, where my sister has a, has a home. Uh, we saw the rugged coastline of Tofino and Euclulet, a uh, beautiful place. We enjoyed the vistas of snow-capped mountains, the stunning flowers of uh, Bouchard Gardens, and isolated lakes with pristine, clear water. It was an absolutely gorgeous uh, time for us. It was also unique in that we spent time with my siblings. So it was just, so that's a picture, I think, a picture of my two brothers. Do we look alike? I'm, I'm the handsome guy on the left, just in case you didn't know. <laughs> And I have a sister as well, and so the four of us and our spouses were all together. And uh, we were all looking forward to spending time in this location. We thought it'd be really nice, but not all of us were convinced that it was going to be a restful and peaceful time. Because just because we're siblings doesn't mean we always get along. And uh, just because we're all Christians doesn't mean that we always agree on theology and, and uh, doesn't, doesn't mean that we've actually worked out all of our childhood issues. And so uh, getting together, just the four of us with our spouses for that length of time, uh, you know, there was some possibility for some really uncomfortable conversations and triggers and all those kinds of things. But, I, but we all made the effort to come together and I'm very glad that we did because it was, it was great to be together as a family. And as I, and I got back, I started to think about how this really illustrates the church uh, and life in the church because there's this beauty to the church and we talk about it a lot. We talk about the beauty of Christ. We talk about the, uh, the, the majesty of who he is, the multi-dimensions of his grace and the fact that he has created us as a body, the unity of the body, the wonderful love that flowed through the cross to us and now we are generously applying that love to others in the church and we talk about the beauty of the church and the wonders of, of that. But there's also another side to it. And that is a recognition that not everything is always well, that there is some brokenness in our lives, that there is some wounds and, and unhealed uh, past, and, and we're not always operating out of humility and uh, maturity. And so there's also that part of it that can come. So there's a beauty to it, but there's also a brokenness that can sometimes be present as well. And so I believe that this is what Paul is addressing in the text we're going to be looking at today in uh, Galatians chapter 6. He says there are challenges that we face in our relationships and there can be some hard edges to it, but there's also a beauty as we live by the Spirit. Now, Pastor John, last week, he talked about this conflict that every Christian has, and that is whether we, whether we uh, abide and, and live by the fleshly desires and, and our carnal nature, or do we live by the Spirit. And uh, so we looked at that text in Galatians chapter 5, and, and we saw how uh, actually we have a choice to, to decide whether we're going to live by the flesh or by the Spirit, because we have been set free by Christ. Before Christ set us free, we didn't have a choice. We actually needed to, I mean, by, by nature, we were imprisoned by our carnal nature, but, but we have been set free of that. So we can choose to live in the flesh, or we can choose to live by the Spirit. And, and Paul puts it this way very beautifully in, in chapter 5, verse 13. He says, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Now take note of that. We're going to come back to that. Use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. So Paul goes then into describing what does it look like to live by the flesh? Well, it's pretty ugly and uh, pretty challenging. But what does it look like to live by the Spirit? And he says, well, there's, there's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's a beauty. It's a bounty. It's what God has given to us as we live 
by the Spirit. And then in verse 25, he says this. This is the challenge he gives us. Since we are living by the Spirit, since you're living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. So, okay, what does that mean? What does that actually look like, Paul, to live by the Spirit? I'm glad you asked, because Paul actually answers that question. And he says, what it will look like, at least in part, it will impact your relationships. You will see it show up in the way you relate to one another. You'll see how you are relating to our brothers and sisters here in this church. How we treat one another, how do we relate to one another. That's where it's going to be revealed. And he gets very practical, and he talks about what that should look like. So we're going to look at two parts of it, just like he did in chapter 5. We're going to look at how, what does it look like to live in, this, in the flesh, and what does it look like to live in the spirit? What does it look like to, how do we should treat, how we should not treat people, and how we should treat people? So let's go to the first one. Last verse of chapter 5 in Galatians. How not to treat others. Verse 26. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, being jealous of one another. Now I find this to be a fascinating verse because what, what Paul is saying is that how you view yourself will actually impact the way you treat other people. How you see yourself will come out in one of two ways. It comes out in provoking people or in jealousy and envy towards one another. So the word conceit here in this verse comes from a Greek word. It's a unique Greek word. It only is found once in the whole Bible. And, and it's, a, it's a unique word talking about, it's describing somebody who has this opinion of themselves that is that is empty or vain or, uh, or false. It is a wrong opinion of themselves. It's a false idea of who they are. Quite often it's a case where somebody thinks more highly of themselves than they should. Or it could be the other way as well. They're thinking of themselves differently, lower than they should as well. So this, this is a false estimation. And as a result of having a, a wrong understanding of yourself, relationships suffer. In fact, if you, were, if you were to think about this, at the root of almost every relationship that is deteriorating is this root, is that there is a wrong understanding of self. Either an inflated or a deflated understanding of yourself. So it poisons relationships. And so Paul says it does it in two ways. First of all, he says you can provoke one another. What does that mean, provoke? Well, it means that you're coming up to somebody and you are challenging them to a contest. You are saying to them, in essence, I am far more superior than you, and I'm going to prove it. In fact, I'm not going to just prove it. I want you to know it, and I want you to feel it. I want you to experience how much better I am than you. And, and, and you can try to debate that, you can try to prove otherwise, but in the end, you're going to lose because I'm better than you. Now that sounds pretty aggressive and pretty, uh, pretty over-the-top kind of thing, but I don't want you to limit your thinking about this. Maybe you have an image of two guys, macho guys, that are fighting it out in the schoolyard trying to prove their, their value better than others, but I want you to think about this in broader terms and understand that we do this in so many ways with one another. We try to prove ourselves better than others. We provoke people. We can provoke people in, in when we disagree with them. There's a way to disagree, and then there's a way to have an attitude of superiority. Now, you don't have a clue what you're talking about. Uh, we, can, we can provoke people in, in our material possessions. You know, uh, my phone is far better than your phone. Uh, my boat is bigger than your boat. Uh, my, I mean, you can go on and on. We can do that in our material possessions. We can talk in such a way that we can show our superiority over others. We can do that in knowledge. We have this attitude of superiority in the way we talk about other people, in the way we, we talk about um, demean others in their intellect. And so there's many ways in which we can provoke people in having this attitude of superiority over, over others. And sometimes we don't even have a clue that we're actually doing it. We have a problem. We don't recognize it. We don't see it. We don't have the self-awareness about how we are 
provoking others because underneath it we have this attitude of superiority. I've been told on more than one occasion that I've had that problem. And uh, I, I know it's a shock to all of you. Uh, but it is good for us to hear that because there are un, uh, un, uh, understood pieces in our life that still come through in our superiority attitude that we have towards others. There's a second way in which it can come out. And that is when we have this attitude of seeing others as superior, that we are inferior, and then we have this jealousy, we have this envy towards others. So at the root, it's the same thing. We're not having a correct understanding of ourselves. It's a false, it's a fantasy kind of idea of who we are. And so we see others as superior, we see them as, as better, we see them as better looking, as, as wealthier, as more gifted, as all the achievements, and, and, we just, and we hold resentment against them because we don't like that. We don't like it that they're better than us. And so we find ourselves comparing and finding ourselves wanting as a result. So whether or not we have a superior attitude or an inferior attitude, it causes problems in our relationships. Either we're going to be challenging them and, and trying to you know, show that, that we are better, or we're going to uh, feel that they are better and envy them. The end result, of course, is poor and deteriorating relationship. How very different this is in how the Spirit brings love into our relationships. When we are guided by the Spirit, we have no self-conceit. We have a correct understanding of self. We do not carry an inflated or a deflated understanding of ourselves. Paul says this in Romans 12, verse 3. He says, Do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. Think of yourself with sober judgment, a correct understanding of who you are in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Again, Paul says something similar in Philippians 2, verse 3. He says, Instead of being motivated by selfish ambition and vain uh, vanity, in other words, having an a, a incorrect understanding of yourself, he says, You should, in humility, be moved to treat one another as more important than yourself. Now, how do you do that? I mean, for many of us, this is not natural for us to think about others as more important than yourself. So how do we do that? The only way is for us to have a renewed understanding of what Christ has done for you. To have a complete and true understanding of the fact that you are sinful, that you are unworthy, and it was only based upon Christ and his sacrifice on the cross that has enabled you to have a relationship with him. It is only based upon what he has done for us, not what you have done, not on what you have accomplished. It's only what Christ has done. And that levels the playing ground. That levels the playing field. And so it is actually deplorable and unloving for us to compare ourselves to others because it diminishes the impact of what Christ has done on the cross. If you think are better than others, have a superior attitude, then what we are doing is we're diminishing the fact that Christ had to die for us on the cross. And we think that we're less than others. We're also not understanding the fact that when Christ has raised, raised us from the dead and, and cleansed us from, from our sin, that he has placed himself in us and we are of infinite value and worth according to Jesus Christ. And so having a correct understanding, a sober judgment about who we are is vital for us to have healthy relationships with one another. So Paul is saying this, that a true Christian relationship does not consist of rivals, rivalry, but of service. We are not to compare ourselves. We are not to challenge one another to see who is superior. Neither are we to, to be jealous of others out of an attitude of inferiority towards others. But we are to act in love and to serve one another. Use your freedom to serve one another in love. So we don't consider ourselves better. We don't consider ourselves worse. We are each created in the image of God and created by Christ. He has died for you. He has invited you into this family. And now we have the privilege of serving others in love. So now we move to 
how we should treat others. This is what Paul says in chapter 6, verse 2. And I love this verse. Carry one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. By the way, just as a side, I mean, this whole, cha- this whole book is about Paul talking to the Judaizers and, and talking to them about the law and saying, well, the Judaizers were saying that you need to obey the law in order to be saved. And Paul says, no, that's not true at all. And so he's taking, giving a side glance to the Judaizers and saying, you know, if you want to place burdens on somebody, this is what you need to do. Carry the burdens of one another. And that's the way you fulfill the law. A fascinating argument from Paul. And I want you to, don't miss the assumption in this verse, by the way. This is important for us to get this. The assumption on this verse is that we all have burdens. And God expects us not to carry themselves. He he wants us to carry each other's burdens. I came across this fascinating uh, study. It just came out last year. And uh, this study uh, analyzed people that that kept secrets, and they found out that the average person carries with them 13 secrets. Five of those 13, they have never told anyone. And and they they did, they actually studied like 13,000 real life secrets that people keep, and everything from lies that they have had, uh, with thefts, uh, you know, sexual indiscretion, uh, you know, betrayal, uh, abuse, all those kind of things. And they, they discovered this. First of all, they discovered that those who carry these secrets, what was so difficult and the burden that they bore with that is not so much the secret itself, but the fact that they were always thinking about it. They're always dealing with it. And the mental energy that it took for them to, to deal with it. People literally felt physically heavier their perspective actually changed. So they, for example, they, they asked them to, to determine, you know, given a, uh, uh, a response to how steep is this hill or how long of a distance. And people who are burdened by these secrets or preoccupied by these secrets always judge the hill to be higher and the distance to be longer than other people. So the perspective of the world actually changed as a result of this preoccupation of these, uh, these secrets. The second thing they discovered was that people tended to think about these secrets when they were alone. Uh, it was uh, alone with, when they were with their, with their own thoughts. In other words, people were spending the mental energy more when they were alone thinking about these secrets than they were even trying to conceal those secrets. So what does this all mean? Well, it means that we all have burdens. And not just necessarily about secrets that we bear, but we have other burdens that we bear as well. We have worries. We have temptations that we are struggling with. Uh, We have sorrow. We have doubts. And we often mull over these things when we are alone. And what does Paul say? Paul says, carry one another's burdens. Carry one another's burdens. We've talked about what does it mean to be a friend, a a true spiritual friend, is somebody who who has a vision for your formation. Specifically, they want Christ to be formed in you, and they they were willing to go into labor over it. I don't know if you remember that message a couple of weeks ago. Well, here is an example where Paul says, I want you to go into labor over your friends. I want you to carry their burdens. And what you see when you see a, an elderly person or maybe a young child who is carrying something that is far too heavy for them, the first thing you do is go over to them and, and help them. And so God is saying to us, as soon as you see somebody that is carrying some burden, may not be a physical carrying a burden, but you see something that they are carrying, you come alongside of them and you, and you speak to them and you listen to them and you pray for them and you encourage them and, and you're doing, you're carrying a burden along with them. Being a burden bearer is actually a a beautiful ministry. Do not consider this to be a, a menial task or something that is mundane. In fact, Paul says, if you, if you think this way, Paul says this, the very next verse, Paul says, if you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You're not that important. 
How would you like to memorize that verse and put that on your mirror? You're not that important. In the context of helping somebody, because if you think you're superior to others, you're not going to want to carry someone else's burden. You're not going to want to invest in someone else's life. You're not going to want to care for them because you think it's somehow beneath you. Again, Paul is saying to us, how we view ourselves will have an impact in how we are relating to others. If you see yourself as superior, you're not going to, you're going to challenge people, you're going to provoke people. You're not going to want to carry the burdens. If you see yourself as lower than them, you're going to be envious and resentful. And Paul says, have a sober judgment about who you are. Have a sober judgment. We need to have a profound awareness of our own sin, of our own unworthiness, and at the same time, a profound awareness of the fact that Christ has called you to be his child and that you are of infinite value and of worth. And we use that freedom to love and to serve one another. Let's pray together. <coughs> Jesus, we want to thank you this morning for for your willingness to die on the cross for us. Even when we were not wanting it, even when we were at enemy with you, even, even though we thought we could handle life on our own and, and we could be our own God in essence, that we could handle uh, with our own strength, with our own wisdom, that we could make it to heaven somehow by our own strength. And God, we, we confess. We ask that you would forgive us for forgetting about who we are and how desperate we are in need of your grace. Forgive us where we have felt that we are more important than others. Forgive us where we have thought that others are more important than us. And help us to see ourselves for who we truly are. Uh, someone who has been, uh, who has, have you have come to die for and to elevate us into this relationship with you. And now we have this freedom to love you and to love others as a result. Give us the humility and the trust to do so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.